I want to first thank everyone who has joined us today for this important and timely program on what's next, diversity in education after the SFFA versus Harvard and UNC decision. I am, as you probably have seen if you follow me on social media, extraordinarily excited about today's program. It's my pleasure and honor to serve as the moderator for this symposium. Um, and before we get started and I introduce our uh, esteemed panelists and begin our discussion, I wanna say a few words about today's program. So today's program is being co-sponsored by Rutgers Law School and NACUA, the National Association of College and University Attorneys. Barbara Lee, my colleague and distinguished university professor here at Rutgers, serves as the editor for the Journal of College and University Law, uh, which is called JCOOL. JCOOL is published by NACUA, and it is the nation's preeminent peer-reviewed journal dedicated exclusively to post-secondary education law. When Barbara asked me to serve as an editor for a special issue of the journal dedicated to the Supreme Court's decision in the SFFA cases, I enthusiastically agreed, and I knew immediately who would be on my wish list of contributing authors. I am delighted that they all graciously agreed to write for the special issue, and given the real powerhouse lineup of scholars I was fortunate to secure, I thought it would be a huge missed opportunity if I did not share them all with you by convening them in this live symposium um, to accompany the publication of the special issue. And so today's program was born of that idea. Um, given our sponsors, our audience for this program is a mix of both scholars and practitioners. So I feel obligated to note that the format and content of this program will be more in keeping with a scholarly dialogue than a pr practitioner's roundtable. In other words, no one here today, including myself, is speaking on behalf of either of our sponsoring institutions or even their own institutions. We are simply a group of scholars engaged in a scholarly discourse around some of the most pressing issues in higher education today. And we hope that the dialogue both among the panelists and with the audience will enrich our collective understanding of these issues. So with that, let me introduce my academic dream team. First, some of you may have noticed that we are short one panelist. Professor Liliana Garces, um, who was supposed to be participating on behalf of a larger group of social scientists who have contributed to this special issue, uh, regrettably fell ill yesterday and is unable to join us. But we will all do our best um, to cover some of the important issues that Professor Garces would have addressed relating to Asian American students and how their experiences were featured in these cases. But we do still have a powerhouse lineup here today with the rest of our panelists, starting with Professor Jonathan Feingold. Um, Professor Feingold is an associate professor at Boston University School of Law and a co-host with Arnie Arneson of the podcast Race Law. We also have Jonathan Glader joining us from uh, the University of California Berkeley School of Law, where he is a professor and associate dean of curriculum and teaching, and he also serves as the faculty director of the Center for Consumer Law and Economic Justice. Next, joining us is Professor Vinay Harpalani, who holds the Lee and Leon Karolitz Chair in Evidence and Procedure at the University of New Mexico School of Law, and who will be this spring a visiting professor at Boston University School of Law. Finally, we have um, Richard Kallenberger. Kallenberg, my apologies. Professor Kallenberg is currently a senior fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute, and he is also a non-resident scholar at the Georgetown University McCourt School. And finally, a professorial lecturer at George Washington University Trachtenberg School. There are so many more things that I could say about these highly accomplished, prolific, and nationally recognized scholars, but time is short, so I will direct the audience to fuller bios of each of our our panelists, which are available from their respective institutions' websites. I am again delighted to welcome these panelists and to invite you into a conversation with us around the Supreme Court's decision this past June in Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard and UNC. But before we begin that discussion, let me remind the audience that there is a Q&A feature available to you to submit questions at any time during the discussion. I will be monitoring those questions and will, will incorporate them into my discussion with the panelists as appropriate, um, but we have also reserved time at the end of the program exclusively for uh, engaging with the audience through questions. So with that, I'm going to get started. And I want to start by asking each of the panelists to take just a few moments to give us an overview of the thesis of their paper and to really set the stage for our discussion by telling us how you've been thinking about and uh, reacting to, especially in your writing, um, the Supreme Court's decision in these cases uh, this past summer. 
Professor Feingold, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, Professor Hawkins. I want to um, just express how grateful I am to be part of this uh, formation of scholars writing on such an important issue. Uh, the topic that we're talking about is a lot about a lot of different things, one of which is opportunity and trajectories, how we ensure that everyone, regardless of the world they live in, has essentially an equal opportunity to um, thrive and to access all the benefits that come from living uh, in the United States. And so it's, I think, worth noting that, so in some sense, I'm the junior member um, of this group, and I have personally benefited from everyone else that you see on the screen through some visible, a lot of invisible um, mentorship uh, and just generosity. Uh, and I just think it's worth noting because oftentimes you see people in particular positions and you forget that the only the only reason they're there, like obviously we all work hard, is because a lot of other people help them get there. And so, so I just want to um, note that to start. I'll be um, very brief right now in my more substantive uh, opening and just offer what I think are really important categories to help not just us here, but more broadly um, everyone who's having conversations about this case and its implications, make sure um, just to facilitate uh, and better enable us to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So um, first, I want to distinguish between affirmative action on the one hand and alternative action on the other. Affirmative action, as we know, is a term that can mean many, many different things. At least for me today, when I use the term affirmative action, I'm going to be referring to um, what others might refer to as race conscious admissions or racial classifications. But the specific mechanism or means that Harvard and UNC were employing in order to realize a um, racially diverse student body. And so again, affirmative action, race conscious or racial classification, I'll use those terms interchangeably to refer to policies that distinguish between individual applicants on the basis of their um, racial identity, often just self-identified. Um, and that is really focused on, again, the means or the mechanism. The question is, is the institution distinguishing between individuals based on identity, based on category? Alternative action, in contrast, the distinction would not be the goal. So still the goal is racial diversity or racial integration, racial inclusion, whatever you want to call it. But there is no longer a racial classification. It is a policy that is employing what the Supreme Court would consider a quote unquote race neutral alternative or a facially neutral policy. Um, just as a concrete example, at the end of Justice Roberts' opinion, he makes clear that nothing in his opinion um, circumscribes the university's ability to consider an individual's experience with race or racism. Um, and considering experience with race or racism is a facially neutral classification because it is considering an individual's experience, not an individual's identity. As a practical matter, we might say, well, that's, you know, you're cutting it really thin, um, and you are, um, because for all the reasons that we all know, it is very difficult to disentangle experience with something like race and racism from an individual's racial identity. Um, but as a matter of constitutional jurisprudence, constitutional doctrine, it matters a lot because the racial classification what was at issue in the Harvard UNC policy triggers strict scrutiny, heightened judicial review, judicial skepticism that at this point, uh, and I'll fight with myself a little bit on this later on, but it's going to be very hard to um, legally defend. But that still leaves the entire universe of facially neutral strategies to realize the same goal. And those strategies remain le legally, excuse me, insulated from legal critique because they do not trigger strict scrutiny. Um, but again, so the one distinction that I want to just highlight that maybe will be helpful is affirmative action versus alternative action, whether or not the policy employs a racial classification. Um, and then also we might distinguish between mechanism and means. When it comes to strict scrutiny, really the focus is on a mechanism and not means, but I'll leave it there. Thank you, Professor Feingold. A very provocative opening. Um, Professor Glader. 
Thank you so much. I want to echo Professor Feingold's remarks about, about this event. It's really an honor to be invited to participate, um, and it's it's humbling to be on a, a panel uh, of this caliber. And um, Jonathan, it, it, I think you might have been selling yourself a little bit short there uh, in, in your, your standing here. Um, so our discussion of affirmative action, it, it's a policy related to opportunity to access higher education at some of the most selective institutions in the world, right? That's the context in which we're, we're talking about it. Um, so it's obviously tremendously important, both culturally and politically, even though most students in the United States don't go to schools with these characteristics. It's still incredibly politically significant. Disproportionately, our leaders are coming from, from schools that are highly selective. Um, so the battle over it has played out in the Supreme Court, which is itself a powerful political institution that's operating in our contemporary historical moment, in our contemporary, our current political context, in our political, certain cultural context. And this highest court in turn functions within a web of rules, practices, what the court has said in its prior decisions. My focus is on here on, on how the court has navigated or maybe ignored some of the important claims in the challenges to consideration of race and admissions in light of the court's own prior decisions, not just about affirmative action, but also about how the court is supposed to make decisions. Uh, so I'm going to be more specific, uh, but I'm also I'm going to be brief because I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're all going to be having. I've been struggling with the doctrine um, implicated in affirmative action decisions, particularly the failure to grapple with the issue of causation. And I'm gonna summarize what I'm worried about and why I think it matters. And I'm gonna do it by focusing on an earlier stage in the litigation when Harvard filed a motion to dismiss the claims by the plaintiff's students for fair admissions um, in federal court, the trial court um, in Massachusetts. The students for, for fair admissions, uh, Harvard argued, did not have standing to bring the suit, meaning they had not established that they, had, they, that they were the right party to bring the case or that they hadn't suffered an injury, right, so that the case should not have been allowed to proceed. And Harvard's motion to dismiss didn't work, in, largely because the trial court found at least one member of this association, Students for Fair Admissions, um, had created a challenge to consideration of race and admissions that was viable, right? It was a sufficiently concrete injury to satisfy standing doctrine. So far, so good. Problem is there are actually some additional questions related to standing, again, this question of who can sue, uh, that the Supreme Court has identified in multiple decisions in the past and the association's capacity to sue on behalf of a member, that's just one. The other two are causation and redressability. Causation, meaning the act or practice that the plaintiff is challenging, is in fact the cause of the harm the plaintiff suffered. And redressability, right, this is logical, meaning that the remedy that the plaintiffs are asking for will actually prevent or otherwise resolve the injury that's been inflicted. Neither the trial court, nor the First Circuit Court of Appeals, nor the Supreme Court considered these other aspects of, of standing for reasons maybe we'll get into in the, in the Q&A. Um, so over the course of the litigation, the plaintiff's theory of how exactly Harvard had harmed Asian and Asian American applicants to the college changed. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking about whether any of these theories are accurate. That's that's not my focus. My focus here is, is what the, the, the what the law um, should require. So at first in the complaint, the plaintiffs rather conclusively stated that the defendants intentionally discriminated against people like the plaintiffs on the basis of race. Later in the case, the plaintiffs presented evidence that they argued showed that particular aspects or stages in Harvard's admissions process, the more subjective personal assessments, were biased against Asian and Asian American applicants for admission. And here's where the causation question gets really interesting. And a number of folks have already pointed out the, the problem here. If it's bias that causes the harm, then it's not the explicit consideration of race in the college's affirmative action program that causes the harm, or at least is not the sole cause of harm. We have a causation question. Further, if the explicit consideration of race is not the cause of harm, then ending affirmative action on the basis of race will not prevent the harm in the future. That's a redressability question. And maybe we can talk about no one made this argument in the litigation, but it relates to a certain Jonathan Feingold's excellent article on why the college was not, was an ambivalent advocate for affirmative action. 
So why does any of this matter? I'm, I'll wrap up. It matters because if explicit consideration of race is per se unconstitutional, then challenges to any programs intended to help people of color are absolutely vulnerable. As CRT scholars have pointed out for years, though, to challenge discrimination that is not formal policy, plaintiffs have to prove intent, which they may not have easy access, they may not have easy access to evidence to show. So discrimination against Asian and Asian American applicants could persist, as various scholars, Eugene Kang, Jeannie Sukerson have pointed out, um, because of focus on the wrong mechanism, right? Because not of the failure to identify what is the actual cause of harm. So thank you very much. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Professor Glader. I, I hope that this is whetting your appetite for the really robust and kind of insightful ways in which these scholars are thinking about this case and these issues. Uh, Professor Harpalani, I want to invite you to make your uh, uh, thesis statement next. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, inviting me, uh, Stacey. Uh, my paper is called Secret uh, Admissions, uh, Secret Admissions, and it's about the process of a holistic admissions, holistic review, and some of the consequences uh, of the way that uh, admissions uh, works at elite universities. Uh, I'll just say, you know, I talk to lay people about my research a, a fair amount. Uh, you know, I research on affirmative action. That's kind of what I made my career on, uh, looking at affirmative action in university admissions. Uh, so I talk about admissions and lay people, uh, people who, you know, don't think about this issue every day, uh, you know, don't study it. They understand what grades and test scores are. You know, people in our educational system have, have received grades, have received test scores. Just about everyone has taken a standardized test. So they understand that. Uh, putting that in the context of the Gratz and Gruder decisions back in uh, 2003, uh, if you recall, the Gratz decision uh, uh, struck down uh, the University of Michigan undergraduate uh, College of Literature, Science, and Arts policy, which used 20 points on a 150-point scale, gave 20 points to underrepresented applicants. Uh, so I talk about that. People tend to understand that also. You know, whatever they feel about it, they tend to understand it. Whatever they feel about grades and test scores, they understand what they are. Uh, going even back to the Baki system, uh, which uh, was struck down in 1978, and uh, that was UC Davis Medical School, where 16 seats were reserved uh, for underrepresented uh, applicants out of 100, uh, you know, the notion of a quota, which is kind of in the public eye, the most uh, common understanding of affirmative action, even though uh, universities are not, not never allowed to apply that after 1978. So people, you know, there's some understanding of what a point system does, of what a, uh, you know, what a set aside would look like. But this idea of holistic admissions, which was upheld in Grutter, you know, the Supreme Court said, you can use race as a flexible factor based on individualized review. And I'll tell you just exactly, you know, I have the quote here from Gruder. Uh, Universities can engage in a highly individualized, holistic review of each applicant's file, giving serious consideration to all the ways an applicant might contribute to a diverse educational environment and is flexible enough to consider all pertinent elements of diversity in light of the particular qualifications of each applicant and to place them on the same footing, although not necessarily according to the same weight. When I try to explain holistic admissions to people, I, I get a lot of puzzled looks. Uh, you know, what does that mean? How is race considered in this? You know, it's flexible for each individual applicant, but that just, it doesn't ring like a 20 point, you know, a, a set 20 points or a set aside. Uh, there's a lot of questions about how that works. Uh, and what I argue is, that choice between Gratz and Grutter, you know, Justice O'Connor chose the Grutter plan. That was, you know, she was the fifth vote there. She talked about why she chose it. Um, you know, she thought that it's better to uh, make the race, uh, use of race more obscure so that, you know, one applicants are not stigmatized. You don't know how much it matters for one applicant versus another. She thought that was less stigmatizing um, than, uh, a, say, a, a point system that gives every applicant, every underrepresented applicant, 20 points. But it also clouds the whole process in mystery. Uh, universities use holistic admissions in different way. You know, if you look at scholarship on holistic admissions, they critique uh, the lack of transparency, uh, that uh, every institution does it a little differently. There's no consensus. And what I argue is that facilitated future litigation. Now, after Grutter came out, it's interesting, uh, two commentators from, the op from opposite ends of the political spectrum really uh, predicted that there would be a lot of future litigation because of this decision. And that was Justice Antonin Scalia, who said so in his dissent, you know, that this is just prolonging the controversy. And then Professor Derek Bell, 
the founder of critical race theory, or one of the founding figures in critical race theory, also predicted that there'd be more litigation, that this is a litigation prompting decision. And of course, they were right. You know, Fisher v. Texas was brought, the SFFA cases uh, were brought later on. Um, and the way the SFFA cases were brought and, uh, you know, argued and litigated was wrapped up in holistic admissions. You know, if we had a point system, say, uh, if, if, the, if the court had gone with Gratz, Universities would know, okay, you can use 20 points on a 150 point scale. That's how race has to be weighted. Uh, you know, that's explainable. Uh, but the holistic system, how is race used? Uh, well, Gruder put a lot of other parameters on that also. It can't place an undue burden. It can't uh, be a predominant factor. Uh, eventually, you have to phase it out. Uh, it was an invitation there. You know, uh, race is hidden in the process. And I argue that facilitated the SFFA litigation. I, I argue that it's going to facilitate more litigation because although you know, uh, different aspects of Grutter have been kind of abrogated. The notion of holistic admissions, which really, you know, more, I mean, holistic admissions go back, it goes back before Grutter, but Grutter really brought more attention to it. Uh, you know, the use of race, uh, you know, how race is used or how other factors are used, still kind of clouded in mystery. So uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' statement about uh, using essays, that uh, essays applicants can discuss their experiences with racial discrimination. How do you tease that apart from using race itself? There'll be challenges that say universities are still using race to one extent or another. That happened at UCLA a number of years ago after California had banned uh, affirmative action. There were accusations that UCLA was still using race. So I look at the implications uh, of all that, uh, implications of using holistic admissions for this whole controversy. Thank you, Professor Harpalani. Um, and again, we're going to be digging more deeply into all of these theses in our discussion. But uh, first, um, I want to give Professor Kallenberg an opportunity to present his work. Great. Th thank you. Uh, I appreciate this, and and I'm I'm really happy to be to be on this panel as well. Uh, this is this is a stellar group, and I'm I'm learning a lot already. So uh, I'm going to talk about new avenues to diversity and be very forward looking and, and very practical for those in the audience who might be admissions officers or, or lawyers. Uh, I'm, I'm really thinking, uh, thinking about, about you guys. Um, okay. So I uh, was really struck that right after the decision came down, the Biden administration put together a summit uh, on you know, what next. And there were two comments in particular that, that stuck out to me. One was from Angel Perez, who's the CEO of the National Association of College Admissions Counseling. And he said, don't let a crisis go to waste. This was a chance to, to rethink admissions. Uh, and Colorado College President Son Richardson said, affirmative action made us complacent. Now that the tool is gone, that tool is gone, and I'm optimistic that we can work together to fix uh, what she called our broken system. Well, what is that broken system? Uh, back in uh, 2005, uh, William Bowen, uh, former president of Princeton, was a, who was a strong advocate of race conscious affirmative action, uh, did an analysis at 13 elite colleges to find out what counts in admissions. And in the Supreme Court oral argument, you heard the lawyers at University of North Carolina say there, there are 40 different factors that we look at. And, and that is true. I don't doubt them. Uh, but some matter a lot more than others. And here's what mattered, uh, at least at this point in time, in admissions at these 13 elite colleges. The biggest boost went to recruited athletes. Uh, they get a 30 percentage point increase in their chances of admissions. So that means if they had a 30% uh, chance of admissions kind of on the merits, now they have a 60% chance of admission. You just add the 30 points. Underrepresented minorities uh, saw a 28 percentage point increase. Legacies, uh, you know, those, the children of, of the most advantaged, some of the most advantaged people in our society, uh, incredibly, received a 20 percentage point increase boost. Uh, every college will say, well, of course, we consider the students who've overcome economic obstacles in admissions. Turns out that wasn't really uh, all that true. Only a tiny four percentage point increase for first generation students. And if you were in the bottom income quartile compared to the others, you, you, uh, you got no boost whatsoever, according to, to Bowen. 
Now, more recently, uh, as part of the litigation and uh, students for fair admissions litigation, there was a chance to analyze, well, what matters in admissions at Harvard and what matters at admissions at, at uh, UNC? And I was an expert witness in the case. I argued that uh, racial diversity is very important in admissions. And in fact, the, in the oral arguments, the UNC lawyer kind of called me out. Uh, even their expert believes racial diversity is important. It is. Uh, and, uh, and during the analysis, we, uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Peter R. Sidiakno from Duke, crunched the numbers, looked at what counts in admissions at Harvard. Basically the same lineup as, uh, as uh, William Bowen found. So these are the low gen estimates. The bigger the number, basically the bigger the uh, preference. So recruited athletes got the biggest preference, uh, then African-American students, then legacies, then the children of faculty, again, a very privileged group, uh, Hispanic students, uh, much lower down the, uh, in an early action, again, uh, an advantage group gets a preference, lower down on that scale, disadvantaged students and first generation students. Uh, so what would happen if instead Harvard rejiggered its system, uh, got rid of the unfair preferences, the preferences for legacies, the preferences for uh, faculty children, we actually kept uh, uh, athletic preferences in the simulation, although one could play with those as well, and instead gave a boost to socioeconomically disadvantaged students of all races. Uh, the boost was half the size of the uh, athletic preference. And you can see white admissions decline, uh, Asian American admissions increase, black admissions decline from 14% to 10%, which I'm going to talk about in, in one second. Uh, Hispanic admissions increased. Overall, underrepresented minorities stayed the same. Uh, the academics of the class remained stellar. They were at the 98th percentile in terms of SATs rather than the 99th percentile. High school GPA was very, very high. And you saw more socioeconomic diversity uh, under, the, uh, under this system of providing a, a socioeconomic preference. One thing that's really important to mention is that we did not have access to Harvard's data on wealth. Uh, that is your net worth. Uh, and uh, I have long argued that students who come from low wealth families uh, have less opportunity on average in America and should get a boost in admissions. Uh, well, because of uh, our history of slavery, segregation, redlining, uh, black wealth is, uh, is a tiny fraction of white wealth. So here are the, the income gap between black and white people is, you know, is substantial. Uh, the wealth gap is gargantuan. And so if we were to look at, uh, at that factor, in addition to those that I mentioned, then you, then you could see uh, even more racial diversity come into, come into play. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kallenberg. Um, even in her absence, I would be remiss if I did not at least attempt to share with the audience uh, what I understand at least to be the thesis of the paper authored by the group of social scientists on whose behalf Professor Garces was scheduled to appear. And I will not be in any way as articulate or as um, incisive as she would have been. But as I understand that thesis, just briefly, um, the Supreme Court in its SFFA opinion um, struck down Harvard's and UNC's use of race in admissions, at least in part because the majority said that both schools relied on illogical racial categories that didn't make any sense, impermissible racial stereotypes, and in doing so engaged in uh, negative discrimination against Asian Americans. Um, however, the social scientists in this paper argue that it is instead the majority itself who is guilty of both stereotyping um, and harming Asian American students by striking down these race conscious admissions. Um, and first, they, they, they argue that the court failed to apprehend um, the evidence, um, uh, some of which was provided uh, by them in an amicus brief signed by over 1,200 social scientists, demonstrating that, in fact, race and racialization are real, even if socially constructed identities, and that Asian Americans, in fact, do share um, an identity around uh, racialized discrimination and that kind of history and experience of racialized discrimination. Um, they further argue that um, it is the majority uh, that also traffics in, or uh, instead perhaps traffics in harmful stereotypes about Asian Americans, particularly using 
um, stereotypes of Asian Americans as model minorities and academically high achieving um, to really demonstrate this point about how they are harmed as a group um, by race conscious admissions, when in fact these social scientists point to data showing that there are wide variances in both academic achievement and social status among the various Asian ethnic uh, subgroups. Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, um, the, the Supreme Court disregarded the record evidence in the case about how admissions were actually conducted um, by erroneously concluding that Asian Americans as a whole suffered negative discrimination from consideration of race, again, uh, based on these kind of stereotypes about what the Asian American identity is, um, that is, you know, this model minority and academically high achieving, rather than acknowledging that many um, Asian Americans in the record evidence demonstrated that they did, in fact, uh, benefit from the consideration of race and admission and have shared those individual stories across kind of these racial and ethnic subgroups. Um, and so I hope that um, we can touch back on some of these points as we move through the discussion, despite Professor Garcia's absence. Uh, but what I, I want to do now is turn to the moderated portion and kind of dig more deeply into some of the things that each of our panelists were talking about um, in their insightful opening comments. So Professor Feingold, let's go back to you since you opened us. Um, and you um, had this fascinating uh, distinction between affirmative action and alternative action that I think that, as you say, more, more people are familiar with in terms of you know racial classifications or race consciousness and race neutrality. Um, that's, I think, a, a kind of aspect of your um, argument that many people are familiar with. Um, but but most people are, are now in the aftermath of this decision focused on what you call alternative action uh, or race neutral action because they presume and, and you argue incorrectly that affirmative action has actually been banned after SFFA, that, th that it cannot any longer be pursued. But you argue that there are still lots of opportunities, right? Like lots of mechanisms for engaging in um, a, a race conscious action or affirmative action without running afoul of even the holding in SFFA. And while you highlighted the kind of strategic loophole of the essay, you go far beyond that in identifying these affirmative actions that still remain viable. Can you tell us about some of those uh, strategies that many people might might be overlooking? Um, thanks for inviting uh, the question. And so I think um, uh, you're right that um, right now, my guess is most administrators, most um, uh, attorneys representing or advising universities are um, assume that it is unconstitutional to employ racial classifications within university admissions. Uh, now, I think it's arguably true that the current Supreme Court would not uphold any university admissions policy that employs racial classifications, but that's different than the law as it stands, at least as a formal matter. Um, and there's multiple ways in which a university could um, theoretically, quite plausibly, quite reasonably, defend the continued use of a racial classification, notwithstanding the Supreme Court's decision in SFFA. And again, I'm not trying to be naive um, that this court would uphold a policy, but as a legal matter, like um, institutions should not say that affirmative action is dead if the Supreme Court has not said affirmative action is dead. Um, I would much prefer an institution to say, look, we actually formally can do this, but for various reasons, we are choosing as a political decision, not as a legal decision, to avoid a particular policy. But let me just give you some examples. So to begin, prior to SFFA, the Supreme Court had held that under Grutter and again under Fisher, tracing to Bakke, that a narrowly tailored admissions um, race conscious policy designed to promote um, racial diversity um, satisfied constitutional requirements. SFFA, Ed Bloom, asked the court explicitly to rule that racial diversity could not constitute a compelling interest and to overturn Grutter. Justice Roberts did not do that. Uh, Sotomayor essentially chastises him for doing in practice what he didn't do in form to look less radical. But as a formal matter, Grutter is still good law. Certainly, the sort of conceptual boundaries of what racial diversity means have been meaningfully constrained. Um, and again, 
I see Professor Harpalani smiling because I think he, like, which I think is just sort of a recognition that, okay, well, like maybe like that's nice for your law, like your law review article, um, but is that actually going to um, stand in the court of law? Like, like what we've already heard is that facts don't matter with this Supreme Court. Um, and what I'm inviting universities not to do is to overlearn the law in a way that then overdetermines policy decisions down the road and to at least acknowledge on the books what the law is. On the books, diversity rationale is still good. And there are ways in which universities could articulate their interest in diversity in a way that actually mitigate or soften the concerns that the Supreme Court often associates with racial classifications. One example are racial stereotypes. So one thing, one just weird thing that I'd love to hear another person comment on is how um, the social construction of race entered the conservative justice's opinions as a reason not to employ affirmative action. The notion being that these racial categories are um, amorphous, they're ever changing, they're societally um, uh, created and um, essentially clued together these incredibly heterogeneous groups, which is of course true. But what we also know is that those categories do real work in shaping institutional environments. And that when certain students who are racially identifiable in particular ways find themselves numerically underrepresented, particularly severely, we know from decades of social science that they are going to confront racially hostile environments. And that stereotypes about those groups are actually going to be more acute. Um, which is just all to say diversity rationale still exists and there are ways that um, institutions could offer a more capacious view of diversity that actually responds to some of the Supreme Court's uh, concerns about racial classifications. Two other quick examples. Uh, this notion of distinct interests. So there was the footnote that I know Professor Harpalani has written on um, that noted that the Supreme Court's uh, decision only referred to the interest in diversity that Harvard and UNC articulated and explicitly carved out military academies as institutions that have a potentially distinct interest in racial diversity. Personally, I see no reason why someone who at least is a champion of affirmative action would read that footnote narrowly. Justice Roberts did not say that military academies are necessarily the only type of institution with a potentially distinct interest. And I would certainly urge medical schools and law schools to ask themselves whether or not they could marshal such an argument. There's actually an amicus brief from the American Association of Medical Colleges that in many ways offered that argument for medical schools, which trades on the fact, and I think it's fair to say fact, that more doctors of color particularly more doctors who identify as Black or African-American, actually saves lives. And that seems to be a distinct interest in diversity, to the extent it is diversity, than what we saw um, from um, uh, ha uh, Harvard UNC. Last really co quick concrete example. The Supreme Court, the conservative justice hostility to racial classifications is predicated on the empirical claim that Formally considering race is a preference, that it is deviating from what previously was an objective and neutral policy in which race was not relevant to determining particular outcomes. Interestingly enough, um, Justice Powell in Backey dropped a footnote that said that racial classifications might not actually constitute preferential treatment if they are used to counteract essentially fraught measures of merit that predictably understate the existing talent and academic potential of individuals from certain racial groups. I, among others, have consistently said that universities need to make clear that race is not being used formally as a preference, but rather to counter all sorts of racial advantages that inevitably and otherwise flow to white applicants. Uh, I, again, I'm not naive. Um, the current Supreme Court is not going to um, accept that argument. Um, but for purposes of making the sort of strongest moral and constitutional case for racial classifications and um, race consciousness writ large, it is a problem that institutions, including Harvard and UNC, consistently fail to recognize that in their facially neutral criteria, race already predominates. And it is only and the, one of the few ways to actually mitigate the role that race plays is to account for it. I went on way too long. I apologize. Um, but thanks for everyone's uh, generosity letting me go too long. 
Thanks, Professor Feingel. And, and again, uh, really resurrecting some key arguments that were raised in Baki, to your point, both the training diverse future doctors, which uh, Justice Powell only said lacked um, kind of empirical support, not kind of constitutional defensibility, um, and this idea of counteracting um, existing preferences that are stacked against uh, uh, underrepresented minorities. Um, uh, I want to uh, make sure that I invite anyone to comment on that or, 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 or to respond, especially because Professor Glader, I'm sorry, Professor Feingold said that he was interested in that. Um, but uh, but I would also invite um, Professor Glader to talk about this really, really fascinating idea about the real flaw that I think has gone really unnoticed um, in the SFFA cases around this kind of interaction between standing, causation, and redressability um, that really might open up some opportunity for thinking about how um, colleges and universities really need to be responding if, you know, the ostensible, uh, you know, kind of command on behalf of the Supreme Court, which is to to, to discontinue um, race conscious admissions, does nothing to redress the ostensible harm to the extent that anyone thinks that there is harm against Asian Americans. We're, we're not doing anything about that. Do we have an ongoing obligation to really address that issue? But Professor Harpalani has his hand up. So uh, let me um, allow you to respond to Professor Feingold, and then uh, Professor Glader, you can answer that question. Yes, I, you know, I'll, I'll be brief. I actually agree with most of what Professor Feingold says. I mean, I have a, a little different interpretation of Gruder. You know, I do think it was pretty much, you know, functionally uh, overturned. But I agree, you know, uh, we shouldn't necessarily look at it that way. I think his view is reasonable. I think, you know, kind of arguing, you know, kind of through the doctrinal cracks is, is a very uh, important uh, endeavor. Uh, so I have a different view of Gruder, but I just wanted to make uh, one more point that I think actually may uh, boost his argument. The the point about the uh, the AAMC brief about uh, you know uh, minority physicians really saving lives, you know, pr providing service to underrepresented communities. Uh, you can boost that even by going back to Baki, because in Baki, uh, you know, the uh, UC Davis Medical School actually argued that we need more minority physicians. Uh, to serve underrepresented communities. The reason Justice Powell rejected that argument, he said there's no evidence for it. This was 1978. The affirmative action was pretty new. You go to the 80s, uh, you go to the 90s, there are a lot of studies that show that, uh, in fact, underrepresented minority physicians do serve a lot in underserved communities, that race itself is the best predictor of who will serve in those communities in the long run, better than socioeconomic status, better than a lot of other factors for that purpose. Uh, so I agree with you. Uh, I don't think the court would buy that argument, but it is important to make it for the public discourse. And Professor Glader, before we get to you, I think Professor Kallenberg wants to jump in on this uh, commentary. Professor Kallenberg. Yeah, I'll be real brief. But while, while we're jumping in, uh, I, I would point out that uh, UC Davis Medical School uh, you know, which was subject to the Baki litigation, has been in the news recently because they actually have a quite robust level of racial diversity, even though under you know, Prop 209 in California, they weren't allowed to use race because they have developed a very comprehensive adversity score uh, that the New York Times wrote up. So I, I'd encourage everyone to look at look at their model because that's a way to to try to s square these concerns. Racial diversity is very important, especially in a medical school, uh, but there may be ways to do it without explicitly using race in admissions. Thank you, Professor Glader. Okay, I'm, I'm, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and pick up where your your question left off um, about you know, what's going on when the court doesn't engage in this particular analysis to figure out whether there's a, a fit between the remedy they've imposed that Professor Feingold and Professor Harpalani and Professor Kallenberg are talking about, right? The, the putting, putting an end, although how clear an end, we have to wait and see what institutions try and what courts allow um, to consideration of race and admissions. I think that the simple, the simple fact is the conservative supermajority on the court didn't care about engaging in the analysis that I'm talking about. And, and I, no one on, on this panel is gonna be surprised by that, right? That the goal was to, um, for, for at least, I'm gonna to defer to Vinay on how many, but several of the justices in the conservative supermajority wanted to put an end to consideration of race and selective institution admissions full stop, right? No nuances, no, no nothing. 
Um, and they weren't going to let the details of standing doctrine get in the way of the story they wanted to tell about what how the how the case got to the highest court. And we've seen a similar approach in, in the student loan case that came down at the same same time, right? Similar, just not that concerned about standing. Now that response on on my part is kind of facile at another level because there's another reason the justices didn't want to grapple with this question of whether the plaintiffs could have suffered an injury um, as a result of discrimination independent of formal affirmative action efforts of the college. And that is that no one made the argument I'm making, right? No one tried, no one said that. Uh, and it's easy to see why, right? You, you, would, you would be shocked to see Harvard saying in its motion to dismiss that, look, maybe our admissions officers were biased against applicants of Asian descent as the plaintiffs are arguing. And so, you know, we're liable for that, but, um, you know, our affirmative action efforts to benefit other students of color should be allowed to survive. That That's not a position the institution would, would want to take, not least because the evidence, right, the court ultimately found did not show that there was discrimination against applicants of, of Asian descent, right? On the other side, so that so that understand why Harvard's not not making the point that I'm I'm trying to identify. On the other side, given the plaintiff's interest in undoing race-based affirmative action in college admissions, there's no reason to develop a theory of harm that would get in the way of that goal, which which focusing on the fit between the remedy sought and the cause of the injury would would result in. Um, so it's it's easy, right? Easy to see why why the argument wouldn't be wouldn't be brought up. And the other reason not to, and this really picks up on on I think a uh, conversation that Professor Feingold is inviting us to have, um, is if we start asking questions about what is really causing underrepresentation uh, of folks who are from historically formally excluded uh, racial and ethnic groups in these selective institutions. If we're really going to ask about what the barriers are, we have to start looking at what are the criteria that are factors in admissions, right? Um, do those criteria relate to goals we care about? Or do we, for example, do we want to admit only the students that are going to perform the best, right? That's one of the rationales that's often trotted out for some of the objective criteria, which makes no sense if we then have a hard curve, because that means, does that mean that the bottom half of the class is always a mistake? No, of course not. That doesn't, that makes no sense to make the, to make the claim. Um, so if, if academic performance should not be the point of admissions, then what should be? Um, some school admissions officers might be relieved that they can worry less or not at all about promoting opportunity for historically excluded groups, but others, right, are going to be forced to now, and I think this is what, what Song Richardson's uh, quote that Professor Kallenberg used kind of points to are going to have to have some hard conversations some and engage in some hard thinking about what what do we want our admitted classes to look like what are our goals and what tools can we constitutionally use to achieve them I went on too long too I'll stop thank you Thank you, Professor Glader. And, and again, I would be remiss if I did not in, in, in insert here that the um, social scientist paper um, that uh, Professor Garces would have presented, you know, is in complete agreement around the fact that the Supreme Court really identified both the wrong villain, i.e. race conscious admissions, and really the wrong victim in terms of Asian American students, right? Um, that there really is just a mismatch of the kind of evidence and the kind of outcome in this case. And so um, that means colleges and universities are really left with a complex puzzle, right, about um, the uh, uh, the remedy that has been imposed, right, uh, uh, on them, the kind of injunction to d discontinue race conscious admissions really is not the solution that anyone should be seeking, right? It does nothing for Asian Americans. It, it continues to, you know, impose uh, uh, undue harms on um, underrepresented minorities. And, and you know, to, to Professor Kallenberg's point, um, it, it also does nothing to um, increase and and, and provide greater access to other um, underserved populations. And so, so we're really just left with, I think, a, a, a bit of a mess from the Supreme Court in terms of moving productively forward. Uh, Professor uh, Feingold and Professor Kallenberg, I think you both want to comment here. So we'll do Professor Feingold first and then Professor Kallenberg. Thank you. Um, and I'll be brief. Part of it, just to say how much I appreciate Professor Glader just raising something that the media is totally missed. And I think most scholars are missing both the mismatch between the evidence of anti-Asian bias and the remedy and the standing question. But for any doctrinal junkies out there, um, it's worth noting that um, conservative justices have opened the door 
for um, anti-affirmative action type challenges in ways that have retreated from um, general sort of standing um, presumptions for this for a long time. And so one case that I just um, have pulled up is Northeastern Florida chapter of the Associated General Contractors of America versus City of Jacksonville. Um, I don't think anyone learns that case uh, in law school. It's actually an important case. Um, it involved a 10% set aside um, for minority contractors at the city of Jacksonville. You know, Jacksonville comes from in a state with a long history of um, pretty um, uh, violent racial terrorism um, had imposed. And the question was, well, is there standing by an organization that would not have received a contract, even if you didn't have that policy in place? And Justice Thomas said, yes, there is standing. Um, and his words were that the injury, in fact, in an equal protection case of this variety, so one involving a quote-unquote racial classification, is the not denial of equal treatment resulting from the imposition of the barrier, not the ultimate inability to obtain the benefit. Um, and so, you know, 30 years ago, Justice Thomas is already sort of um, viewing as sort of the constitutional harm the racial classification, the formal consideration of race, whether or not that actually impacts someone's ability to um, obtain the benefit. Thank you, Professor Hawkins. I'll just say something really quick. Um, I think I found your uh, your presentation really interesting, Professor Glader. I think there, uh, there are lots of questions around standing that uh, that I'm not, not particularly qualified to to comment on. I did teach law school, but that was, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And so I'm a little rusty on that question. I will point out, though, in terms of the anti-Asian bias claim, uh, that was certainly front and center in the, the Harvard litigation. It was not at issue at the University of uh, North Carolina litigation. So I just want people to be clear uh, that uh, these cases were not only about anti-Asian uh, litigate anti-Asian bias in the in the process. Thank you, Professor Kallenberg. So, so Professor Harpalani, I want to turn to you because you have given us again another really fascinating intervention in this discussion. One that I think that we don't kind of raise to um, kind of the public consciousness often enough, which is that you know holistic admissions themselves create a whole host of you know. Uh, problematic features, um, not just for admissions in terms of its secrecy and kind of lack of transparency that lots of people complain about, but also because it makes colleges and universities a prime target for litigation uh, because people don't know what's going on and they are going to assume the worst. Um, and so um, I, I, I really find that fascinating. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about these holistic admissions and you know how they've been employed, how they've shifted, but in particular, um, in this particular set of cases, um, how they may have facilitated these allegations of negative discrimination against Asian Americans, and in particular, in ways that don't really allow the court or um, uh, the litigants to fully understand what's going on, right? Because there is clear evidence and argument on behalf of some that Asian Americans weren't harmed, right? But but maybe there's something about the way in which these schools were doing admissions that don't fully allow us to um, appreciate what's going on. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, there's a whole history uh, to all of this dating back to Baki, dating back to that whole time period. You know, I do, you know, I don't think the plaintiffs in SFFA proved intentional discrimination against Asian Americans. I think the lower courts got that right. But I do think, you know, there are reasonable concerns there from Asian American, uh, you know, Asian American activists and others about what happens in the admissions process. Now, you go back to Baki, uh, you know, that's when diversity really started to become an issue because that was the compelling interest that was upheld uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. This is also the time that you saw kind of an explosion of Asian American students at uh, elite universities. And there was a backlash to that, you know, and, and I write about this. I write about this in, in several of my articles that white students felt these Asian uh, American students were too competitive, that they're curve breakers, you know, uh, different schools were labeled with epith epithets. MIT was called Made in Taiwan, UCLA, University of Caucasians living among Asians. There were some racist comments also by admissions uh, personnel there was a study at Princeton that really that showed that you know Asian Americans who were accepted had higher grades and test scores, but were rated lower 
on personal characteristics. And of course, SFFA made the same claim uh, at that time. There were uh, investigations by the uh, Department of Education Office of Civil Rights, and they did find that UCLA discriminated against uh, five Asian American applicants, and those applicants were ordered to be admitted, uh, all in this context of this holistic process. Um, now, Harvard was cleared of discrimination in that investigation, but SFFA drew on this history. SFFA uh, also drew the analogy between discrimination against Jewish students back in the early 20th century uh, and, uh, you know, holistic admissions and how it treats Asian American students uh, now. They drew on that analogy. And in fact, part of the origin of holistic admissions was in the 1920s when you saw more Jewish students coming to Ivy League schools. Um, and, you know, uh, the admissions process was, was changed a bit to focus more on, quote unquote, character, uh, quote unquote, uh, integrity. These things were Jewish uh, students or Jewish people generally were stereotyped in very negative ways. Um, so there's a whole history there. Even in the 80s, you know, these analogies were brought. It was, uh, you know, uh, some supporters of affirmative action made that analogy, even between Jewish students, uh, how they were treated and Asian Americans were being treated. treated. Uh, so, uh, but that also speaks to the distinction between affirmative action and negative action. You know, the discrimination against Asian Americans, uh, to the extent it happens, and I'm not, you know, uh, I'm just saying that the perceptions are reasonable because of the history. I mean, it was it was rejected in, in Harvard, but to the extension it happened, it happens. It's separate from affirmative action to benefit uh, underrepresented students. So everything that SFFA argues was back there in the 1980s. They drew from that history. They cited that history, um, and I think you know, in in the context of that history, you know, I think some of the concerns are reasonable. We see this uh, we see this kind of controversy in other. Uh, kind of admissions also in magnet high school admissions. And I know uh, Professor Feingold is writing about that. So this is not an issue that's going away. You know, the, the, the positioning of Asian Americans in these types of admission system, so, which, you know, often are holistic, you know, now even at the magnet school level, you know, you look at uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, High School, which is being sued in Fairfax County, Virginia, they use a holistic system also. Um, and, you know, the, the issues are a bit different there, but I think, you know, this is an issue that's going to continue uh, to be uh, something that we're, we're going to need to deal with. Thank you, Professor Harpalani. Um, Professor Kallenberg, I want to return to you um, uh, to give you more space to talk about um, SES preferences. And, and, and I want to, to say we have a question directed to you from the chat. You mentioned um, in your um, introductory remarks that there was a decline from 14% uh, to 10% of uh, Black um, uh, students uh, when they shifted from race conscious to um, SES preferences in the simulation that you discussed. And they were curious um, for you to explain that. But more than that, I want you to answer that question. But more than that, um, I want to um, kind of notify the audience in case they were not aware that even before the SFFA cases, yes, you were an expert witness in SFFA, but um, even before then, you were arguably one of the biggest proponents of replacing racial preferences um, in college admissions with SES preferences. Um, and, and, and one of the claims that you have made now in the aftermath of SFFA is that um, really colleges and universities should be seizing on all of this kind of um, uh, uh, research and advocacy that has been done around SES uh, preferences as an alternative because you don't think that the kind of essay exception that uh, Chief Justice Roberts offers at the end of his majority opinion um, is, is, is really a kind of um, a uh, good alternative. You you think that it carries a great um, uh, opportunity for a kind of legal risk, um, especially I think uh, connecting back to what Professor Harpalani was just saying about the kind of um, opaqueness of holistic admissions and the kind of presumption that will be ongoing that um, if they're trying to use that essay in this kind of holistic admissions and they achieve the same results, then the default assumption is going to be that they're still just using race. And you think that that that's going to be problematic. Can you say, um, number one, um, what caused that decline in response to the um, audience member's question, but talk more specifically about the um, the kind of vulnerability that you think exists around these essay um, uh, exceptions, which, by the way, lots of schools have already adopted. Great. No, the, um, the two great questions. Uh, so thanks to the audience member and and thanks to you, Professor Hawkins. Uh, so on the on the point about the decline from 14% to 10% for African-American students in the simulation. Uh, what I was suggesting is that uh, the simulation underestimated the potential for Harvard to create uh, more 
uh, black representation in their class using race neutral alternatives because in the simulation we had limited data and we did not have access to information about student wealth and there is no variable there's no socioeconomic variable that better captures uh, our history on race of racial oppression than does wealth so wealth uh, is handed down generation to generation and so it, it uh, encapsulates in a more efficient way uh, the the uh, the history than does current day income uh, or current day parental education levels uh, so uh, so that's 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 the explanation um, so uh, as to your to your larger question professor Hawkins um, I do think there are really two paths moving forward for universities uh, if they want to engage in racial diversity, uh, have racially diverse classes. Uh, the first path uh, is to exploit the personal essay loophole uh, to its fullest, which is cheaper uh, and much riskier. And the other alternative is to adopt authentic race neutral alternatives like a percentage plan that Texas used uh, or like uh, affirmative action based on socioeconomic status, which is more expensive because you have to provide financial aid to these students who are going to be admitted, uh, but also is, uh, is much less risky legally. So uh, why do I think it's less risky legally? Uh, you saw from the um, the SFFA decision, a number of opinions and concurrences and dissents. And one of the common denominators among the dissent and the, uh, the concurrences was that using uh, socioeconomic status, things like uh, financial means, uh, levels of education of the parents is, is perfectly fine. And so the dissenters, the three dissenters act actively encouraged universities to pursue this path. Justice Thomas said nice things about race neutral uh, socioeconomic alternatives. Professor uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch actually en endorsed uh, the, the simulation that I had done, which, uh, which looked at socioeconomic disadvantage. Justice Kavanaugh was very clear that he was not going to take that next step, which is coming from the, in the, in the Thomas Jefferson case of whether uh, socioeconomic preferences and percentage plans are, are themselves illegal. And in the past, Justice Alito has said very positive things about, about those authentic race neutral alternatives. Uh, the essay question, by contrast, is, is I think much riskier. So there, there are really two pieces of the essay loophole. One is if a student uh, faced adversity because of racial discrimination, that's something I personally um, you know, think universities should count. If someone faced racial discrimination and did pretty well despite that, uh, that, that ought to be part of the admissions process. Uh, if adversity, though, is part of what a university is considering, I think going forward, they'll be much safer if they applied across the board. That is, students who face all kinds of adversity should get a, a preference, not only those who face racial discrimination. The second example, uh, which is, is uh, talked about as inspiration, that is your race, uh, racial experiences inspired you in a certain way, uh, is um, it also will only be legal in my view if it is applied across the board. So to give you one example, and I think it's important to give examples with this because people often don't know exactly what that means. The US Department of Justice and Department of Education said, Here's an example of how you can use this legally. They said, if you're a Hmong student and you were inspired by your grandmother to engage in, in cooking, Hmong cooking, and it, it, it kind of uh, was something that has become important to you, a university could, could consider that factor. And, uh, and I think that's you know, something universities might consider. But if they apply it to Hmong students who are underrepresented, and don't apply it to a Chinese American student who's inspired by her grandmother or a Greek American student is, who's inspired by his grandmother about cooking, then it looks like you're going right back to uh, the idea that the Hmong student 
contribute something different and distinctive because there are fewer of them in the admitted pool. And that gets you into a lot of, a lot of hot water. So I actually think that a university that, uh, that adopts authentic race neutral alternatives like socioeconomic preferences uh, provides a shield of sort against uh, litigation because if your racial numbers are looking pretty good, as we hope they will, uh, and you don't adopt any race neutral alternative, you keep your legacy preferences, you, you don't uh, announce any new financial aid initiatives, then the suspicion is going to be that you're using this personal essay loophole in an, in an unfair uh, and illegal manner. Thank you for that insight, Professor uh, Kallenberg. And we have Professors um, Feingold and Professor Glader who want to comment, uh, but I want to remind the audience that you can submit questions at any time. I am going to be monitoring that and we're going to be turning to an audience Q&A in, a, a, in just a little while. Um, and in the absence of those questions, we will continue to have a discussion among ourselves. So please, I invite you to um, put your questions um, in the Q&A. And in the meantime, we're gonna hear from uh, Sorry, right, Professor Hawkins, who did who goes first? I'm sorry, fine, cold, and then later. I apologize, I muted myself too quickly. Um, I think that it is correct um, that universities who do fewer things, um, certainly explicit and in public ways to uh, promote, maintain, advance goals like racial diversity will be less likely to be um, sued. But I think that it's important to recognize that we are in a political moment where there are very well-funded organizations that are going to sue institutions simply for saying that they value racial diversity. But something that we have already seen is a um, essentially a talking point that universities are trying to avoid SFFA by employing race neutral alternatives like this essay requirement. And I actually think it's um, a mischaracterization to describe it as a loophole. I think it is just drawing a line that is actually very consistent with decades of Supreme Court doctrine that has distinguished between considering an into student's identity and considering a student's experience. Now, it's true that if a university were to use an essay or any other um, uh, sort of um, or any other information through which they could ascertain a student's racial identity and then base the decision on that racial identity, then that would be running afoul of the decision. But to the extent an institution is considering experience with racism, that is wholly consistent with it. And Justice Roberts includes this language. Despite um, the dissent's assertion, university may not um, simply establish through the application essays or other means the regime we hold unlawful today. The regime that was held unlawful was the racial classification, was considering racial identity, considering racial category. It was not pursuing racial diversity. Um, and so for me, at least, I see, and which is not to say that you might it increased the likelihood of litigation. Um, but to the extent a university is formally considering experience with X, whatever that X is, as opposed to identity, it should, under existing equal protection doctrine, insulate that university from legal exposure. So I was just introduced recently to the character of Debbie Downer on Saturday Night Live. I'm going to try not to be Debbie Downer here with with my my negative take, but but I I, I want to build on what Professor Feingold said. I'm not sure that facially neutral tactics to pro try to promote racial and ethnic diversity insulate the institution using them from litigation risk. And I think the litigation around Thomas Jefferson, the high school in Virginia that has adopted race neutral um, tools to try to promote diversity in its student body is illustrative of the, of the kind of attack we're gonna see, which will argue that, look, these clever progressives are using facially neutral tools 
to do exactly what the Supreme Court has said they cannot do. And so in that way, the facially neutral tool is potentially vulnerable. There's a frustrating irony to this, that facially neutral tools that work against people of color require a showing of intent by the plaintiff who's challenging the facially neutral tool. And the facts of these cases where there was explicit ex explicit endorsement of the goal of promoting diversity will not present the same difficulty in showing intent. Um, so I, I, I worry that the facially neutral approach is, is actually um, uh, not as secure as perhaps before Students for Fair Admissions was decided. Um, and, and I guess to not be Debbie Downer, um, I think that's also part of why the larger discussion about admissions criteria and institutional mission um, is so much more important. And we're starting to see that debate happen for a variety of reasons, right? Like the, the US News and World Report most recent rankings led some institutions to say, wait a minute, some of the factors US News and World Report is weighting don't relate to our institutional excellence or don't relate to the excellence of our students. And so we're, we're gonna get that battle over what merit is and what institutions should do if and when they choose a way to, to recognize it. Vinay, I had, a, I had a sneaking suspicion you were gonna jump in after I said that, I will stop. And if he had not jumped in, Professor Glader, I was going to invite him in. By the way, Professor Glader, I think that you are not being Debbie Downer, you are being very clear-eyed. I think that we are all being very clear-eyed, especially as we see the kind of follow-on litigation that has already been filed by Edward Bloom and SFFA, right? We know where they're going with this. But Professor um, Harpalani, if I could kind of just frame what I'm most interested in, in terms of your um, intervention and response to um, Professor uh, Kallenberg, but, but also certainly adding your own comments, you... Um, quoted from Gruder, and I cannot, you know, restate the very long quote about what the interest in diversity was all about. And one of the things and the ways in which race could be used, and one of the things that you said that really kind of piqued my interest, knowing what Professor Kallenberg was going to say, is that the court said all these considerations need not be weighted equally, right? Like that there, that, 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 that colleges and universities can decide to value some things and not others. And so with that, I invite you to respond. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm probably going to be even more, quote unquote, clear eyed <laughs> uh, than John. I mean, I really appreciate and respect everything that uh, Professor Feingold uh, is saying. You know, I think it's important to uh, make all of those arguments for the public discourse and however they may influence even, you know, a, a, a litigation, uh, you know, future endeavors like that. Uh, but, you know, uh, Professor uh, Glader pointed to the Thomas Jefferson case and, uh, you know, number of things to say about this. I mean, the reason I would say Gruder is functionally overturned, it's not because of the diversity interest. Uh, it's because uh, one of the things that Chief Justice Roberts said in his opinion is that race is a quote unquote negative factor for Asian Americans in admissions. And, you know, uh, Professor Gar says in, in the brief, you know, talked about how uh, affirmative action can benefit Asian Americans, can benefit certain groups, uh, you know, can be taken into account in ways where any individual Asian American can uh, benefit from consideration of race, consideration of all these factors. But uh, it was undisputed, both Chief Justice Roberts and Sotomayor acknowledged that if you took race out of the out of the equation, overall, if you look at the number of Asian Americans, uh, it, it would uh, increase to a small extent. You know, uh, legacy admissions, uh, uh, athletic uh, preferences, all these other things have a much greater impact because Asian Americans are underrepresented, but race does have a small impact. And, uh, you know, Gruder said that uh, use of race cannot unduly burden any group. Uh, SFFA essentially said it cannot at all burden any group. The way J Chief Justice Roberts framed it, you know, if you have any effect on one group, uh, positive effect is going to have a negative effect on, on other groups, and framed it as, you know, that's not allowed. Um, so to me, that effectively overturns uh, Gruder. That undue burden now becomes uh, no burden. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring that up is, you know, this was about changes in percentages of admitted applicants. That is exactly the issue in the Thomas Jefferson case. That's how the plaintiffs made their case, you know, by comparing these numbers. How much did Asian American admissions drop when they uh, changed the admissions policy there? Now, it's in a race neutral context, but it's the exact same arguments. I, I mean, I look at the Thomas Jefferson case, and I'm studying that also, and I see other things in there. 
you know, there were anti-Asian American comments made in some of those meetings, a part of the broader discourse. There's other animus, uh, you know, uh, against Asian Americans. There is evidence of that. That was not the focus. That was not the focus of the uh, of the district court ruling, and which was, you know, overruled at the Fourth Circuit. It focused on the numbers. SFFA focused on those numbers. How do these admissions policies affect the actual uh, acceptance of Asian Americans? And that's what Thomas Jefferson is also doing. And that's part of my thing. You know, I care about all the other stuff that's going on, you know, the, the, and I talked about the whole history of that, you know, the anti-Asian American comments, the epithets that were, you know, labeled the MIT and all that. There's some of that going on. That's what I'm concerned about. But that's another, you know, I think that's another part of the argument that both F Professor Feingold and, and Glader have been making. This isn't really about Asian Americans and benefiting Asian Americans, right? Because if they wanted to make that argument, they would focus on the other parts of, of the animus. They wouldn't focus just on the numbers. Uh, you know, uh, Justice Sotomayor correctly pointed out that Grutter allowed some burden, incidental burden on certain groups. Um, and I think, you know, many Asian Americans accept that, you know, if you look at Asian Americans that's, support for affirmative action, it's 70, I'm sorry, I'm going on, but I'll just that's point okay. out. And that, but that's a great point that, that I really want to raise to people's attention, which is that um, to the extent that you have argued that SFFA overruled Gruder, um, it also overruled other longstanding affirmative action precedent in adjacent kind of um, domains of law. If now, as you say, it's not just an undue burden, but any burden, right, on non-minorities from the use of race. Because even in the employment context, the, the, the standard has always been an undue burden. Yes, we acknowledge that some burden may be imposed and that burden is tolerable, but it was always undue burden. And now the court seems to be switching gears to say any negative impact whatsoever is intolerable uh, with the use of race. But uh, once again, and because we really don't have many questions although there's one that I'm going to direct to uh, Professor Kallenberg after I allow both um, Professor Feingold and Kallenberg to respond to what was just said. So let's start with Professor Kallenberg and then Professor Feingold. Okay, great. Um, so I, I'm learning so much. Thank you. Thank you all. This is a great discussion. I think this distinction uh, that Professor Harpalani uh, and Professor Hawkins talked about it, uh, between undue burden and no burden is a is a really powerful one uh, so, and I hadn't heard it uh, framed quite in that in that manner I think it's uh, I think it's important um, so as between uh, Professor Glader and Glader and Professor Feingold I I'm happy to find myself right in the middle uh, so Professor Glader is more pessimistic Professor Feingold is more optimistic uh, or is at least willing to push the envelope um, and uh, I, I just want to make two points. First, with, with respect to uh, Professor Feingold's um, optimism that, uh, that the, the essay loophole uh, will, will allow universities to, uh, to consider the individual experience of, of race in a kind of a, in a robust and systematic fashion. Uh, you know, just remember the, the dissent and their discussion of the, the essay loophole. Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor was, was, didn't, uh, didn't hold back on this. She said it's lipstick on a pig. She didn't want to put, she didn't want universities clearly to be putting too much weight on the idea that the essay loophole was, was the path to, to success. Um, and then in terms of uh, Professor Glader, I, I agree, you know, they're, they're, we've already seen litigation against race neutral alternatives through this two, TJ case. They're, they're coming uh, and, uh, and I kind of find myself, um, uh, you know, in one sense, uh, switching sides, if you will. I was an expert witness for SSFA. I'm very, very opposed to the litigation against Thomas Jefferson. And uh, so I think the cases can be brought, they will be brought. Ultimately though, I think it would be so radical uh, to suggest not only that racial preferences are illegal, but that any, any other race neutral strategy that, uh, that had at least as part of its goal, uh, racial diversity was also illegal, uh, just takes us so far afield from what the Supreme Court justices have been telling us for the conservative justices have been telling us for decades, don't use race, use race neutral alternatives. And uh, as the as the Fourth Circuit uh, said, you know, that would be the ultimate judicial bait and switch. 
I, I have to remind Professor um, Kallenberg that uh, Justice Sotomayor said that that's exactly what the court did in Chouette, right? Move the goalposts, right? Every time they get close, what you do is move the goalposts. So I wouldn't put it past the court. I agree with you, right? That would be completely and radically um, uh, reversing course on what the even the conservative uh, uh, justices have said. But uh, uh, again, being clear eyed about where we are, we have to understand the context. So Professor uh, Feingold, please. I am optimistic about nothing, but what I'm what I'm hoping to elevate is that equal protection doctrine, even after SFFA, should, if applied consistently, legally insulate face neutral efforts to promote racial diversity or racial integration or things that we would concede are equality oriented racial motives. One thing that we are that um, if you put SFFA and the TJ line of cases together, you can think of it as a broad strategy to transform racial diversity from a constitutionally compelling interest to a constitutionally suspect motive. That is a legal strategy and a broader political strategy because you see just the rhetoric that is, that is in briefs from Pacific Legal Foundation is almost identical to the rhetoric you see in places like City Journal or from the... Um, other sort of right wing think tanks, but it is a broader goal to delegitimize legally and morally what I would just sort of um, categorize as anti racist goals um, and efforts, even if um, facially race neutral. The one thing that I and so, and I think it is really important to, like, as Professor Kallenberg noted, it would require abandoning 50 years of already conservative race law um, that has made a very clear distinction between. Um, racial classifications, and those race neutral alternatives embedded within strict scrutiny itself is um, the at least implicit recognition that there are many racial motives that are not constitutionally suspect. And just with respect to Professor Harpalani's point, so I see SFFA as simultaneously um, closing the door on the TJ litigation, or it should, but also planting what Frank Rudy Cooper would call dicta landmines. And so the notion of negative so negative and stereotype as it arises in SFA is only doctrinally relevant because we have a racial classification, because the racial classification triggers um, the strict scrutiny framework. If you are in facially race neutral land, the negative should not actually be doctrinally relevant in part because the origin of the constitutional concern is a policy that is distinguishing between individual applicants on the basis of their racial identity. Um, and so it, I'm not saying that that's going to matter in D.C. when the Supreme Court hears Thomas Jefferson, but I think it's important that we all understand and appreciate how what that would effectively mean would be to collapse existing race law that has two tracks, one for racial classifications, one for everything else, into a single strict scrutiny track for any effort that is racially um, equality oriented. Thank you, Professor Feingold. So being mindful that we are quickly running out of time, what I would like to do, um, and I have not seen any other questions come into um, the Q&A, so I'm going to pose the, the, the um, only question that is um, in the queue. Um, to Professor Kallenberg. Um, at the same time, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to wrap up because as I said at the outset, this uh, program has a mixed audience of both kind of scholars and practitioners. And I do really want to talk um, in practical terms for a moment as we conclude. Um, really, how can we translate all of this into real policy and procedure, especially because we all just talked about being very clear eyed, right? And understanding kind of what the long game both politically and legally is. And so I want to invite each of you um, in closing to give one piece of practical advice um, for the practitioners in our audience uh, about what they should be thinking about and or doing or not doing as they retool their um, admissions and other um, programs in the wake of this decision. I want to start with Professor Kallenberg because this particular question came in the chat, Professor Kallenberg, which is this idea of wealth that you say is is, is kind of more precise and more effective than income in targeting uh, 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 not just socioeconomic diversity, but racial and ethnic diversity as well. The audience member wants to know, 
Um, is this information that colleges and universities easily have access to, do they capture wealth in any way? And is it possible for them to capture wealth in order to implement that suggestion? So I want to start with Professor Kallenberg, um, and then I want to move um, to Professors um, uh, Glader, because he has his hand up, I want to give you the next word. And then uh, uh, we'll go to Professor Harpalanian, because we started with Professor Feingold, we will end with his final words. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Professor Hawkins. Um, so on the this very pragmatic question of, you know, how, how does a university employ wealth data? Uh, the uh, There are very few institutions in American society that do have access to wealth data. You know, banks, when they are looking at loans, uh, universities have ample wealth data uh, in two forms. Uh, one is through the, the FAFSA, um, the, the student aid form that, uh, that asks a question about wealth. Uh, the other is that in many selective universities use something called the CSS profile, and that provides more granular information about wealth uh, that looks at things like uh, the home equity uh, that is, is part of, an important part of many families' wealth and small businesses. Uh, small business wealth. And so those data are available. Now there is a question, a practical question of timing and, uh, and of the existing firewalls that exist typically between an admissions office and a uh, financial aid office. But UCLA Law School, which has been using wealth for a number of years, uh, was able to address that uh, issue uh, by asking applicants to provide information about their wealth on the application uh, as opposed to just the financial aid form and they they did so by asking kind of ranges of wealth not not you know to the dollar but are you in the, within these ranges and to keep students from uh you know potentially trying to game or game the system or actually you know just cheat outright uh, they say we're going to check uh, this information you give us on the application against the financial aid forms. And if you lie on the federal financial aid forms, you, you, you literally can go to prison. And so you don't want to mess around with that. So that's practically how universities have used wealth. There are some, pe some in, uh, people who are so fabulously wealthy that they don't fill out the FAFSA because they, they can pay all four years at a selective institution. Maybe they've got two or three kids, they can do it all at the same time. We already know what their wealth is. They're enormously wealthy. Uh, we don't have to go through a process of, of ascertaining their their individual wealth. Uh, on the piece of advice, very quickly, uh, I would say uh, engage in the exercise that uh, that we did in the in the Students for Fair Admissions litigation to ascertain what counts in admissions now. Because if you don't know what counts in admissions, uh, then you don't know how changing uh, different uh, processes will impact racial diversity. And I would do it, I would do it through your legal counsel. So it's uh, not, not part of the, uh, you know, you know the, the public record necessarily, but uh, I would, I think that's the starting point. In order to know what's going to work to produce robust levels of economic and racial diversity, you have to diagnose what you're doing now. Uh, every admissions office will say, well, it's this this opaque formula, or no, there is no formula, it's an opaque process, but there is a formula in all cases. Uh, you, you just have to statistically derive it. Thank you so much. I want to do two housekeeping things. One is to note that we have actually um, gone a little bit over time, uh, but I am so grateful for those of you who have held on with us. Um, we will continue to record this program for those of you who have to leave, but I do want to give all of our other panelists at least 30 seconds to offer their parting words, um, especially if anyone wants to talk about their ideas about the legality of legacy admissions. That was a last minute question that just came in, but uh, please, uh, uh, Professor Glader, if you want to go. Thank you. I'll be very quick. At first, I want to echo Professor Hawkins that this court has already shown its readiness to jettison longstanding doctrine. So I think a lot of things that might have previously looked stable, we should not regard as, as stable. Um, but I want to be very clear when we're being clear eyed about strategy to undermine educational opportunity for people who are members of historically excluded groups. That doesn't mean we should not continue to try to promote opportunity for people who are members of historically excluded groups. And, and I'm completely on the same page with Professor Feingold 
hold on on that. The litigation risk is out there, no matter no matter regardless. Um, my hope and my optimism is that we're going to see a conversation about what admissions at these selective institutions should strive to do. And this is a moment to engage pragmatically now in this difficult internal prioritizing. Whom should these institutions admit? Why and what criteria produce the student population that they want? One reason I think that conversation is going to happen is the controversy and attention right now over legacy admissions. It's going to be really interesting to see where that leads because that's one criterion in admissions that, 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 that is, is going to be in, you know, going to be in court. I admit that I'm not that focused on it because I don't know that getting rid of legacy admissions is going to make that big a difference in changing who is admitted. Um, I've, one thing we haven't really talked about and don't have time to talk about uh, is select, selective institution criteria are one factor. Another one that's out there is money. And we haven't, we haven't talked about that um, uh, in, in this context, I think as often as, as we should. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I've uh, look at my paper and stuff. And I'll go back to you know the paper itself. Seems like I'm pretty critical of holistic admissions. You know that this is a secret process that you know that that has all types of consequences. Uh, I'm not sure there's a better process, though. I mean, there are good things about holistic admissions. Also, it allows you to consider all of these different factors, uh, which you know uh, I think uh, inherently promote uh, promote diversity. So I guess my pragmatic note uh, kind of deals with that also, um, because I'm not you know there are good things about holistic admissions. Uh, I'm not convinced, you know, that uh, that it's going to the way uh, the way that it's applied that it's any less subject to gaming than say SAT scores, standardized uh, test scores. Uh, there's a whole movement now to make those standardized tests SAT optional uh, or get rid of them altogether. 1,800 colleges and universities uh, have done that. Uh, part of the the backdrop to that is, you know, uh, well, we can uh, consider other factors. The SATs have a lot of socioeconomic bias. They don't predict. Uh, college grades very well. I think all of that is controversial. Different studies uh, show different things on that. Uh, but the holistic admissions, you know, the way uh, writing the essays, uh, all these other factors, there are expensive college counselors that focus on that also. Uh, you know, my concern about getting rid of the test or anything else, it's going to be replaced with something else that promotes the same level of elitism. Uh, so I think we need to be, you know, just cognizant of, of what the effects of changes in admissions are going to be. Is there a way to get around this privilege in, in, in any way, you know, the way that uh, admissions is structured, uh, the whole issue of implicit bias coming into the process. I mean, that's part of what happens when you, uh, you know, give admi individual admissions reviewers the power to make these decisions. Their biases are obviously going to come into it. So we need, you know, implicit bias training, things like that. So I just want people to think about, you know, all the different uh, aspects of, of what we need to look at going forward if we are going to, you know, use a more holistic process. Um. Thank you again, Professor Hawkins, for including me in this and for everyone for sticking around uh, and for the other panelists. It's been really um, a pleasure to be here, notwithstanding the backdrop that is not super pleasurable. Um, I will just offer three concrete takeaways. Um, one is a university's um, uh, what remains university's right to do after SFFA and two obligations that SFFA or that universities continue to have, notwithstanding SFFA. The right is that SFFA in no way circumscribes universities' right to proudly pro proclaim equ um, equity-oriented values. Like full stop. So continue to um, preach equality-oriented values and then do what you can to actually live up to those. Um, uh, aspirations. Two obligations that universities have, legal obligations, and these flow from Title VI, uh, which really only Gorsuch seems to um, care much about. Um, so the first is that Title VI prohibits um, racial harassment on campus. It essentially creates an affirmative duty for universities to cure racially hostile environments. Um, that obligation, that legal obligation that also exposes universities to legal liability and the loss of federal um, financial assistance um, is one that should not be forgotten right now. And if anything, maybe it should be foregrounded. And also Title VI is implementing regulations, prohibit unjust um, criteria and admissions that produce unjustifiable racial disparities. The federal complaint that targeted Harvard's legacy um, policy Legally, its grounding um, is in these implementing regulations because it is hard to identify um, an educational based justification for legacy admissions and particularly at Harvard, 
they functionally, if not on their face, are a white racial preference. Oh, sorry, last thing, I don't mean to interrupt, but just to highlight how radical the legal argument is that is underpinning the TJ litigation, again, litigation challenging facially race neutral criteria, Pacific Legal Foundation on their website. They say it is perfectly fine for a university to get rid of SAT scores or legacy admissions, but so long as the motive is not racial. The argument is that you can't get rid of legacy if the reason you're doing it is because it provides an undue racial preference for white applicants. That is the argument. Multiple federal judges have already bought it. The question is whether five justices on this Supreme Court will as well. Thank you, Professor Feingold, and thank all of you so much. That is more than the time we were allotted today. So again, thank you to all of you who have hung on through this um, extended program with you. I hope that you have enjoyed this, this discussion as much as I have. I, I mean, I had read the papers and I still was deeply engaged and uh, incredibly enriched by the discussion we had here today. And I have to once again remind you if today's discussion piqued your interest in reading more from each of these scholars on the issues we've been discussing, please stay tuned um, for the publication of the J. Cool special issue on what's next, um, diversity in higher education after SFFA v. Harvard and UNC, which will be out later this year. And trust me, I will be um, promoting it across all of my social media platforms. And so I hope all of you will um, uh, take care to read that when it comes out. Thank you so much again for joining us and have a great afternoon.